All right, good evening. Let's open in prayer and get right into our study for tonight. Lord, we thank you for another night that we can gather in your presence. Indeed, your presence is so sweet, so beautiful. Oh God, we long to, we look forward to come into your presence. And so tonight, even as we gather, we ask that, Lord, you would speak to us. You would minister to us by the power of your spirit, oh God. Lord, cause us to have our hope and our assurance in you that no matter what life circumstances we may see around us, even as we're talking about the end times and all of these things, that we will not worry, we will not fret, but Lord, we would have our rest and our hope in you, knowing that you are still God, you are still Lord, you are still on the throne, and you are victorious. And so we give you all the praise. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. So we are in chapter six of Revelation. We're looking at the first eight verses. And so with chapter six, we begin another section of our study, section four. And we begin the seven seals. The seven seals. Um, and this is obviously the first part, part A the first four seals, and we're dealing with tonight a very popular part of scripture uh, that I was thinking about this, that this is an area of scripture that even non-Christians know about, and that is the four horsemen of the apocalypse, <laughs> right? And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, and you can see I've divided it up, the four horsemen, conquest, war, famine, and death, right? So this, as I always do, I like to give a little bit of an introduction when we start off each section uh, before we get into uh, the particular um, verses that we're going to be addressing uh, tonight, all right? So in terms of introducing this section, of course, now we're making a shift, we're making a transition from uh, chapter uh, chapters four and five, where we were um, talking about John's vision of the throne, uh, and the, the 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 great throne room vision of John, and of course John had seen a vision in chapter one. If you recall, uh, the vision of the glorified Son of Man, the the resurrected Christ in all His glory, was uh, John's vision of chapter one. And that vision of chapter one that prepared the way, and then led into the seven letters. If you recall, in fact, many of the the, the words that were stated in the seven letters came out of that vision uh, uh, that John saw in chapter one. And so it kind of put, paved the way for the letters to the seven churches uh, that we see in chapters two and three. So it is similarly that we see that the vision of chapters four and five sets the stage now for what comes next in the letter or in the book, I should say. It sets the stage for the opening of the scrolls and the releasing of these uh, um, sequence of events that will take place, the, the, in, the, the seals, the trumpets, the bowls, all of these things, the, the, the judgments that are to come that we're going to see in chapter six all the way through chapter 16, right? So this is this is what is going to be happening now from this point on. And so we see this a kind of a, a dramatic portrayal of God's righteous judgment that is, as, like I said, about to now unfold in this, um, in this next several chapters uh, that we're going to be uh, looking at, all right? Now, it should be noted, and this is very important that we note that the scroll is not actually opened until we get to chapter eight, until all of the seven seals are open, are removed, right? And then we get to see the content of the scroll. So in a sense, the content of the scroll only begins with chapter eight, with the sounding of the seven trumpets, right? Uh, and that's when we'll get into that. Right. But right now, we're going to be looking at the seals being broken and being opened. Another thing that is very important to note, and this is very important, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and I mentioned this way back at the beginning when we were doing the introduction to Revelation, is that a mistake that a lot of people make about the book of Revelation, especially beginning here from chapter 6 onwards, 
is that they take everything as a, as happening in a chronological sequence, right? And it should be noted that the releasing of these various plagues and judgments and all of these things that are described in those sequences in the chapters, one after the other, are not necessarily happening in chronological order, right? So don't necessarily think that, okay, so once one event is done, then the next begins. And no, 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 that's that's a very kind of linear way of thinking, right? Uh, and by the way, we know that the ancient people did not think in a very linear, <laughs> in a very linear way. You know, as as I tell my students, you know, different cultures tend to think and process in information differently, right? Western culture, we we tend to process information in a very linear fashion, right? And 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 ancient cultures and 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 other, especially cultures of the Middle East, they don't they don't process things linearly like we do. Right. And so think of it more or less like a layered cake. <laughs> right. All of these things are happening all together. Right. Um, and then what we see at the end is obviously the judgments. And then, of course, the renewing of the earth, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, all of these things. Right. So that is to say, again, the visions do not mean that each of the plagues last only, of course, until the next and then after that is released and then the next and so on. And it follows, you know, the completion until the end in that sense, right? Uh, again, once unleashed, all of these things, it's likely that several plagues, disasters are all happening at the same time, which is kind of a scary thought when you think about it, that all these things are all going on at the same time, right? So again, each seal has been removed. We're introduced to a series of preliminary judgments that represents the forces that are of God that are operating, right, again, throughout history. And of course, God is operating in this way to bring about redemption and judgment and, the, and his purposes are being carried out, obviously, right up until the very end. All right. Okay, so now let's get into the text. Now that we've done that introduction, we begin, obviously, with chapter six from verse one on. And John says, I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take uh, peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Yes the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? The rider in the white horse, the rider in the red horse, the rider in the black horse, and the pale horse. Each one bringing death, destruction, judgment, right, um, in their wake. Uh, and it is something that it is not pleasant. It is not something that, you know, we want to happen, but this is part of God's plan that is that it is going to be unfolding as history comes to a close, right? So we're going to be talking about each one of these four horses and what they represent, each one signifying obviously different things. Uh, but I love this painting because at the very top, you can see the lamb that was slain, right? He rules and reigns over all. All right, so the seven seals that we see here of chapter six, of course, Chapter six continues beyond obviously what we just read, but we see here what happens is it, the chapter is divided into two groups uh, of four and three, 
constituting the seven seals, right? And this is a pattern that we see continuing even into the trumpets in chapters eight, chapter nine. We see the same pattern in, in with the bowls in chapter 16, right? So the four horsemen of the apocalypse, like I said, this these four, four first seals, they're amongst the most widely recognized uh, images or imagery from the book of Revelation. In fact, like I said, you know, you know, people who are not even Christians or believers know about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In fact, there is a, a, a well-known um, uh, relational um, scholar, you know, he, he does a lot of research and writing on relationships and marriage. Uh, he's a psychologist. His name is Dr. John Gottman. And he talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse in any marriage, <laughs> you know, the four things that will kill a marriage dead, right? And so he's, and John Gottman is, he's Jewish, but even he, even him knows about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? So these first four seals are amongst the most widely recognized symbols that we see anywhere. And of course, over the course of history, they have, they, have been, they have been subject to all kinds of interpretation. In fact, one would say checkered history of interpretation. We see the imagery of the horses. Where do, that, where do they come from? Well, the imagery of the horses actually begin or come from Zechariah. So if you want to turn over to the Old Testament book of Zechariah, chapter 1, we will see uh, beginning in verse um, 8 all the way through to verse 17, uh, Zechariah talks about this vision that he had that included these uh, four horses, right? Uh, he says, um, during the night I had a vision and there before me, and beginning, this is from verse eight of Zechariah chapter one, it says, there before me was a man riding a red horse, right? He was standing amongst the myrtle trees in a ravine behind him were red, brown, and white horses. And then he goes on to discuss that. Uh, similarly, if you turn over to chapter six, you see him also talking about these four horse chariots. In verse one, he says, I looked up again and there before me were four chariots coming out from heaven, two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, and the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. So that's kind of an interesting take that we see that that is kind of the background of, of these horses that John is referring to here in Zechariah. The colors here, red, white, black, dappled, gray. They, of course, they, are, they don't have any significance. The color of the horses have no significance in Zechariah. But of course, they do here in, the, in Revelation. In Zechariah, they were sent out by God, these horses, to patrol the earth. The riders are not really even described, per se. Uh, but, of course, like I said, in contrast to uh, John's uh, horses, in John's revelation, these horses have significance, right? In fact, the call of the horses match or have give us some insight into the character of the riders, what the riders are all about. Right, so it's very important to note that these ho these horses and the, the 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 riders definitely correspond. So in Revelation, they correspond to the character of the riders. They they symbolize obviously conquest, which is the white horse, bloodshed, which is the red horse, scarcity, which is the black horse, and death, which is the pale pale colored horse. Right, um, and so now they are released out into the earth to bring God's symbolic. Uh, God's judgment, they're symbolizing God's judgment, obviously, rather than his grace, right? So we've moved from an age on error of grace and mercy. Now we're beginning an era of judgment, right? Now, the other thing that we should note here is that even though the form of John's vision is related to Zechariah and with the horses and the collars. The other thing that I see here and immediately caught my attention as I began to read, uh, you know, through the the the, the on, you know the breaking of the seals and these horses in particular, um, is that it reminds me, it draws my attention to Jesus's sermon on the Mount of Olives, right. If in, in the Synoptic Gospels, by the way, the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are these Gospels that have very similar uh, narrative style, right? 
So if you remember in this discourse, Jesus is talking about the end of the age, the coming of the false Christ, the wars and the famine and the unrest and the things that would happen. Remember, they had gone to Jerusalem. This was happening in the last in the last week of Jesus's life. And they had gone down to Jerusalem, uh, Jesus and his disciples, and they were there at, on the Temple Mount. Right. And for those of us who have been to Jerusalem, you've been to the Temple Mount, you've seen the size of the stones uh, that they used to build the retaining walls of the temple. I mean, some of these stones weigh over 100 tons. That's how big these blocks are. Right. Which amazes me because I don't know how I mean, to, even today, with all of the technology and all of the machinery that we have, it will be very difficult to move these blocks. Right. But you have these humongous blocks that are used and so of course rightly so the the disciples said jesus look at the size of these stones what amazing uh feats of of engineering or whatever and jesus says you know be, you know i tell you very very i tell you not one of these stones will be left upon another and then he begins to tell them if you if you look in matthew chapter 24 he says now let me tell you what will be the signs of the end of the age right i'm going to read uh, a, a few verses from uh, Matthew chapter 24. By the way, you will see the, sim, the same sermon in Mark and also uh, in Luke, right? And so it says here in uh, Matthew 24, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Like I said, you know, look at the size of the stones. Verse two, do you see all these things? He asked, I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will all this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And then Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Right? So this is what we begin to see here in terms of all of these events that are unfolding, right? You know, false Christs will come. There'll be wars and famines, earthquake persecution is predicted in there uh, and all of these things. And so this kind of reminds me of that. In fact, it's very much similar. Like you see, like the souls that are under the altar uh, when, you, when we get to uh, uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. Just like the souls that are under the altar, the disciples are told that the end times, the eschatological era, is, is not yet. Even after all these things have happened, you would think, well, this is when the end has come. This is, this is the end, right? All of the wars and famine and all these plagues and disasters and judgment, this, is, this marks the end. And in fact, many interpreters... You call them, you might call them prophecy teachers, right? These prophecy teachers that you can get, you know, popular prophecy teachers, they often would say, well, that these are the, the end times. These mark the end times. But really, when you read carefully Matthew chapter 24, it doesn't say that the end is yet has come, right? That it one, then in fact, it is only the beginning that if one endures to the end, he says, then one will be saved. Matthew 24, uh, in, uh, 12 and 13. It says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved, right? And note again that these events do not signal the end. These are the beginning of the birth pains, Jesus says, right? So in, in a sense, in, when you look at it, you know, in, in fact, in, in, the Jewish, in the Jewish thought, the age to come was to be preceded by all of this these events of war and destruction and tribulation and trials, right? So these are the beginnings of birth pains, Jesus says, and then the end will come. So these are not the end. The, well, that's what Jesus, if you go back again, Matthew 24, Jesus says, no one knows the day nor the hour. No one knows about that day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, right? And here's what he says, not know the son, right? Meaning himself. 
obviously, as we talked about this, Marty, on Sunday, like as as a, as as a per, as a human, right? Jesus is has had in you know in his humanity is limited in that knowledge, right? He says, "Know the Son, but only the Father." So we don't know, right? Exactly, exactly. With the signs pointing towards when the end will happen, right? But we don't know this. So again, I'm, I'm just letting, giving you a window into my thoughts, right? So just yesterday, I was walking to my car from after work and I was thinking about today. I was thinking about, you know, like at the end of the day, I'm kind of reflecting on what's next, what's, what am I doing tomorrow and all of that. And I was thinking about this particular study and I was thinking, you know what? The end can happen right at about now, just as I'm walking to this car right now, right? And I was thinking, well, that's the reason why every generation of Christians must live in that sense of expectation that they are in the end times, that they are the last generation. Paul and his generation thought they were the last generation and every successive generation since should live as though they are the last generation because we never we don't know the day we don't know the hour we don't know the moment in which Jesus would come right so we must live with that sense of expectation that at any moment he might he might just show up right and we says look up look up for your redemption draws near right so we do that we look up with expectation of his redemption and him coming back to take us to be with him. Amen. All right. So let's go on now to uh, verse one. So he says here um, that the seal he watched as the lamb opened the first of these seven seals, right? Well, of course, it's the lamb himself who begins the process, who opens the first seal, right? He alone, as we just talked about, as we saw from last week, he alone is worthy, right? He's the only one that is worthy to break the seals and to set into motion these events that will bring about the, the end of all time, the culmination of human history, right? And so one of the living creatures calls out with a loud voice. It says, like a like thunder, right? For the first of the four horsemen, the four ap apocalyptic horsemen to ride forth, right, after the seal is broken. Now, what's interesting is when you read certain translations, some translations interpret that come as come and see, right? And they're translating it, and it's, I think it's an incorrect translation if your translation says come and see, uh, because the command is not given to John. He's not saying to John, come and see what's happening here. The call should be understood as addressing the horseman. When, again, if you go through, as I was reading it, he would say, come, right? And when he says, come, he's beckoning the horseman to come forth, <laughs> right? So the, the, the first living creature says, come. And in that sense, he now says to the, to the first, the first horseman to come forth. And of course, that horseman response right and the first one to come forth is the white horse right it says i looked and there before me was a white horse um the first the this first horse is white of course is introduced as uh the white horse And it's interesting to see that, you know, John doesn't, um, he doesn't say how or where the horse comes from. Uh, he just says he just sees the horse, that the horse kind of just appears. Um, and on it is the rider described, he's carrying uh, a bow, right? Um, and this is, this is very interesting that, you know, again, John doesn't know what, where this horse, you know, is, is appearing from. Uh, but we do see that this horse and the rider, the rider is wearing, is, is carrying a bow. He uh, has a crown on his head and he says he rides out in conquest, right? Now, th this particular horse, and we're going to spend probably the most amount of time on this first horse, uh, because um, the identity of this horse, and, uh, excuse me, of this rider, of the white horse, has been described by 
different commentators differently. It has been extensively discussed by, uh, by commentators. Um, so let's kind of look at what they are saying in terms of who this writer is. Who is this person on this white horse? Usually it's one of two responses that we see, right? The, I, I think first of all, I need, I need to make note that the identity of the writer is very important. It's a critical issue, of course. And, and like I said, we see that they have, they have given one of two options with regards to, to who this writer is, right? One option is that the, white, the, the, the writer of the white horse is Christ, Christ himself. And what is happening here is that Christ is writing forth, according to those who interpret it this way, to bring the, the triumphant spread of the gospel, right? Um, to the world in, in the last days. And this interpretation goes back quite a ways. It go, in fact, it goes back all the way to the second century. Uh, in fact, one of the, the church fathers by the name of Irenaeus, uh, he was one of the first ones to kind of propose this interpretation, identifying the rider with Christ and the white horse with the victorious progress uh, of the gospel, right? Now, the strongest argument that they make for this is that obviously he's on a white horse, <laughs> right? Because later on in chapter 19, verse 11, we see Jesus on a white horse. And so they said, well, Jesus is on a white horse in Revelation 19. He is returning in victory. And so then, therefore, it must be Jesus here also on a white horse. In Revelation 19, 11, he says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. Right? And, and also because in Revelation, remember now, there's a lot of symbolism that is involved with Revelation. And so, therefore, the white is symbolic or indicative of righteousness. And so, therefore, this is Jesus riding forth on a white horse, right? Now, at this point, in my opinion, that's about as <laughs> close as you can come to similarities. That's where the similarities end between this horse rider and of chapter six and the horse rider of chapter 19, okay? <laughs> uh, because like I said, that's where the similarities end and the differences become very significant, right? So what are the differences that we see between the white horse in chapter 16 and the white horse in chapter 19? Well, first of all, as I just read to you, the writer of Revelation chapter 6 has no name. The writer of Revelation chapter 19 on a white horse has a name, right? He is Christ and he is called what? Faithful and true. He is called the word of God. God. He is called the King of Kings. He is called the Lord of Lords, right? And he even has a name that we don't know that is a name that he alone knows. Now, we don't even know what that name is. The Bible says it's written on his thigh. On his thigh is written a name that he only knows. So there is a big difference here in terms of who the writer is. Chapter 19 tells us clearly, specifically, who this writer is. The rider in chapter six, the first white horse here, carries a bow. Now, what's interesting is he's carrying a bow, and really the bow is a kind of an unsubstantial weapon. I mean, it, it is a weapon, don't get me wrong, but compared to like the kind of weapon that the rider in chapter 19 <laughs> is carrying, this is not a substantial weapon. And notice, by the way, it's, it doesn't even mention that he has arrows in this bow. It's an arrowless bow. He just says he's carrying a bow, right? No arrows in it. And it's usually associated with God's enemies. In fact, if you go back to Ezekiel chapter 39, that is how this is usually associated, right? So there, it kind of makes you begin to wonder then, this must not be uh, Jesus. This must not be Christ. So if you look in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 3, God says about his enemies, then I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. 
right? So when we talk about these arrows, that's and the bow, that's usually what it is associated with in scripture. And then, of course, like I said, you contrast it with the sharp sword that is proceeding out of the mouth of the writer of Revelation 19, right? Out of Christ's mouth in verse 15. And that is very powerful. Right? Because that signifies, again, destruction. It signifies judgment that is about to make war and wage war and bring justice to his enemies. Right. Also, we see the first writer, he is given a wreath, a, a victor's wreath, a victor's crown. So when it says, and by the way, I, I hope you, I, for those of you who are just joining us, you might, this might be the first time you hear me say this, but I've said it to others before that have been here, that when you read in scripture that a crown is given. So, you know, the, you know, you know, they were wearing a crown in the New Testament. There are two Greek words for crown. One is Stephanos, right? Stephanos is the is the wreath that was given to um, to athletes when they won a race, like the way we give gold, silver, and bronze medals today in the Olympic Games. Back then, they would give them a, a wreath, a laurel wreath that they would wear as the victor of the race or the fight or the whatever, right? And that is a Stephanos. Uh, what kings wear is a different type of crown. It's a, it's a diadema. That's where we get the word diadem, right? It's a diadema. It's a different type of crown. So obviously both are crowns, technically, but different. So when you go back and look at the original Greek text, here in Revelation chapter 6, it says that it was to, to him was given a Stephanos. And in chapter 19, it says that Jesus was wearing many diademas, if I can make it, that's bad Greek, but uh, he was wearing many diadems. So it's two different types of crowns that we see happening here, right? Jesus is wearing the crown that symbolizes royal authority, right? So that's also a very significant point that needs uh, to be made. The other thing that we see is that the first rider goes out like a conqueror out to conquer. But there is no mention of his success. Does he really conquer? Does he not conquer? We don't know. But he goes out like a conqueror wishing or hoping to conquer, right? Christ, on the other hand, is described as judging and making war. Like I said earlier, the sword that comes out of his mouth, right? He is judging and making war against his enemy. In fact, it says in chapter six, excuse me, chapter 19, verse 11, it says that his robe is stained with blood, right? We can presume that that's the blood of his enemies, Right, kind of like we see in Isaiah chapter sixty-three, right, and of course that suggests that he is con he has conquered, he is victorious, he has it suggests military victory. Also, we see that he has an iron scepter in his hand, an iron scepter implying his rule after conquest. A scepter is like again, those of you who watch the Queen's funeral, you saw the scepter on top of her casket, right? That signifies her authority to rule. And then, of course, you saw the crown. <laughs> the crown and the scepter were placed on top of her coffin, right? That signifies her authority, both the diadem, the crown, the royal authority, and the scepter. So Jesus, in this case, has an iron scepter. And, of course, iron signifies domination. It signifies crushing his enemies. He is conquered. He's not going out like a conqueror to conquer. He has conquered. <laughs> he is victorious, right? And so the white horse rider of Revelation presents a very striking picture, a very striking difference from an, of a successful warrior returning with his armies, his victorious armies in glorious victory. And by the way, we don't, I don't want to you know, jump ahead too far, but that glorious army is us, you know? A grand victorious army as we sing in, in, in the song, right? <laughs> Lift his banner up on high. You know, <laughs> if you know that song that I'm referring to, it's a hymn, right? We're a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. It's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. 
washed in the blood of the lamb. All right, anyway. I'm surprised you guys don't know these hymns, right? <laughs> A grand victorious army, blood washed army, well, pure and white. It's a glorious church without sputtering. In any case, that's the army that's coming back with the Lord, right? And it's a victorious army, a successful army prepared to establish his rule after conquest, implying that he's coming to establish his rule. Whereas the writer in, in Revelation chapter six, he is granted authority, but it's not even his authority. He goes out as one seeking to conquer. So this is, a, again, I'm, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm painting a very stark picture here between one versus the other, right? He's granted authority. He goes out as one seeking to, to conquer. And then perhaps in my opinion, again, the final and, and fatal objection to the identification of the writer here as Christ is the phrase there was given to him. And it's used throughout Revelation to indicate a uh, uh, divine permission, right, granted to evil powers to carry out their nefarious schemes and work, right? So it says it, it was given to him. We see this, for example, with the denizens of the abyss in, in uh, chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1, we see they, it was granted to them, right? We see this with the false prophet, in chapter 13, with the monster in chapter 13, the beast, as you know, you know, the beast as we sometimes call him, right? It says it was given to him. So, so in, in a sense, these it's a, it's indicating that they do not have this authority in of themselves. It has to be given. God has to grant them permission, right? And then in, 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 in addition to all of these differences, we see the events that follow the emergence of the writer in chapter six. What follows the writer in chapter six? Well, it's war, it's famine, it's death, right? And this definitely does not, these things are not associated with the spread of the gospel. The gospel is what? Good news, <laughs> right? It's not war, it's not famine, it's not death. Right. So I don't necessarily think that. And then, of course, in contrast to the right of Revelation 19, he confronts the beast. Revelation 19, the right of the Christ confronts the beast. Right. And destroys him and his followers, as we, we see in Revelation 19, uh, uh, 20, uh, excuse me, 19 through 21. Right. It says, then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs they had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. <laughs> Not a pretty picture, right? But that shows that he is victorious. So the marked contrast that we see here between the writer of chapter six and the writer of chapter 19 can be summed up in, 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 in as much uh, words. That the writer of chapter six receives the Stephanos, right? The victor's crown. Not the crown of royal authority or crown of royal rule. It is a symbol of conquest, not a symbol of rulership, right? Whereas the crown, of course, the royal crown is a symbol of royalship and rulership. Also, we see that the writer of chapter six is not a king. He is a conqueror. In fact, he is a conqueror who goes out seeking to conquer. So one wouldn't even say he is actually a conqueror. He is seeking to conquer, right? And of course, the crown was given to him. It's not a crown that belongs to him. It's not his by right. It was bestowed on him by somebody else. So having said all of that, we can hopefully clearly see at this point that this writer is not Jesus. So then the question is, who is this writer? Huh? 
the first writer. <laughs> He's the first writer, of course. What else would it be, right? <laughs> I, in my opinion, and of course, there are many people who have suggested different things, but in my opinion, I think a more likely identity here is that the, the rider of the white horse is none other than the, than the Antichrist himself. <laughs> right? The rider on the white horse is the Antichrist, and I'm going to explain why here in a minute. Right? But by the way, it's... I, I, I believe he's the Antichrist, even though the term does not occur in Revelation. I don't know how many people, how many of you know this, the word Antichrist doesn't show up in Revelation. They call him the beast, <laughs> right? The, the Antichrist, the word Antichrist actually is used by John, but he, he uses the word in, in his letters of first and second John, where he talks about the spirit of Antichrist, right? Uh, but in any case, he, he, he is definitely referred to by other names in the book of Revelation. And he is symbolized in different forms in Revelation, right? As we will see when we get to chapter 11 and chapter 13. But what I think here, and this is why I believe he is the Antichrist, the right on the White House, because he is, he types Christ, he imitates Christ. Hmm? He imitates Christ, but he has very little power of his own. Even that, even what he has is granted temporarily by, by, to him by God, right? And so in my opinion, I think he reflects exactly what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, 24, that many false Christs, right? A false Christ will go forth, right? And so that is why I believe that is who he is, Matthew 24, 24. He says, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive in the, even the elect, if that were possible, right? So he, he imitates, and we know that one of the big, biggest tricks of the, of the enemy is to imitate what God has made, is to imitate righteousness, to imitate that which is good, right? Uh, and, and, and to deceive people. By that, by that way. So he comes out riding on a white horse kicking and looking like he is the Messiah or the, the Savior. But instead of bringing, you know, a destruction to, to the enemies of God, and so he brings nothing but judgment and death and all of these things on humanity, right? And so that's what we see here, right? The, this messianic deception that will be characteristic of the end times. And so in contrast to Christ, like I said, who is faithful, who is true instead and judges judge, uh, judge unjustly, the rider on the, on the white horse brings war, bloodshed, famine, death. And so in my opinion, again, I think perhaps his description reflects the antichrist, the beast of revelation, who is given power to make war, and so that's who I think he is, All right? Now, with regards to the bow, what's with the bow, <laughs> right? The arrowless bow. Well, some writers believe that the bow is um, a veiled reference, perhaps to uh, um, an invasion of sorts, a reference to a much feared invasion from beyond the Eastern boundaries of the Roman Empire. Now you have that to understand what I'm saying here, you had to go back to the time when this was written, around about 96 AD. Of course, this was when John was writing the, the book of Revelation. The Roman Empire was in its heyday, was in its peak. The, 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 um, the, um, the emperor was Domitian, you remember, right? And Domitian was, was a very um, egocentric <laughs> uh, emperor. He wanted people to call him Lord and God. He wanted people to worship him and to build temples to him and to declare him a, a divine being, right? Even while he was yet alive and you wonder what difference does it make whether he's alive or dead? Well, according to the, the imperial cults of the ancient Roman world, once an emperor died, they would be deified. They would be apotheosized. <laughs> the apotheosis of an emperor. In other words, they would become a divine being and they would begin to worship them. But Domitian didn't want to wait till the afterlife. <laughs> he wanted to be worshipped now, right? And so that's what happened. And so then he began to 
to inflict persecution on the Christians. And that's one of the things that uh, scholars believe was one of the, the reasons why John wrote the book of Revelation to encourage these Christians who were, in, who were experiencing persecution. But at this time, the Roman Empire, even though it was powerful and strong, the Roman Empire was not without enemies from outside the empire. And one of the main enemies of the Roman Empire were the Parthians, the Parthian Empire, right? The Parthian Empire lay to the east of Rome. So I will show you the map so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So there's the Roman Empire to the west, the Parthian Empire to the east, right? And the Parthians were vicious warriors. They were known as vicious warriors. In fact, as I mentioned here, in 62 AD, Bologesis the first, who was the king of kings of the Persian uh, of the Parthian Empire, had defeated the the undefeated Roman Empire, the Roman army, <laughs> right? And so they were afraid, they were unnerved by this because nobody had defeated, nobody had conquered, had had beaten the Roman army in in a long time, right? And so they were unnerved but in the West that that somehow maybe the Parthians were going to do an all-out invasion into the Western Roman Empire, right? And so there was this sense of unease and fear with regards to the Parthians. And one of the things that made the Parthians stand out was what became known as the Parthian shot, right? So the Parthian army, unlike the Roman army that was mostly infantrymen, men marching, you know, with swords and shields, you know, the Parthians, they invaded, they marched not on foot with swords and shields, they were on horseback. So imagine thousands of, of cavalry <laughs> on horseback coming against you and you on foot and the, arm, and the Roman army is on foot with, with swords and shield. And the Parthians are coming with horses, you know, and they were known as skilled horses. Now I went back and horsemen, and I went back and looked at this. This was this was before the stirrup. You know, when you ride a horse, you you know you have a stirrup. This was before the stirrup was invented. So they were riding their horses without stirrups. They were you they were just getting on the horse and using their their legs to control the horse without stirrups. And they were known for a particular technique in battle, right? So they will pretend like they were scared and they were running away. And so all the horses will turn and they will start fleeing. And, and like the Roman army would think, oh, we have them on the ropes. And so they would start chasing them. And while the Parthians were fleeing on their horses, they would flip around and then pull out their bows and begin to shoot back at the, the advancing army. It became known as the Parthian shot. Now to pull off this trick was, it shows an immense amount of horsemanship because you have to, again, you have to take your hands off the reins of the horse, that's one, to be able to control the bow and arrow. There was no stirrups, so you had to use your legs to control the horse. And so the Romans were, in, were amazed by this and they were in awe and fear of the Parthians. So when John wrote, <laughs> a horseman going forth with a bow, this is what would have come to mind, right? For that first century audience. They would have thought, oh my goodness, if the Parthians could do some destruction like that, can you imagine what would happen when God sends forth his rider on a white horse? And by the, by the way, it's not shown on this picture, but the Parthians were known for riding white horses. That was their signature, white horses, <laughs> right? So, so that's kind of what we're talking about here in terms of, again, when you take it back to uh, the original audience. All right, verses three and four. So he says, then another horse came out, a fiery red horse, right? And so when the second seal is broken, a red horse now is called out by the second living creature. Now, you cannot tell whether the seals, we can't tell whether the seals are stacked up one on top of the other, or if they are lined up on the edge of the scroll, we don't know. But the seals have been broken regardless, one after the other. And it suggests some kind of progression here. And now you have this rider on this red horse. And the red, obviously, it's like fire, the, the, the call of fire. And the rider is granted power to take peace from the earth by turning people against each other. 
right? Turning people against each other. And so what I'm seeing here and in terms of this is that this first seal suggests an invasion from the outside. The, excuse me, the first seal in, 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 in suggests an invasion from the outside. Again, just like I said, kind of very similar to the, the Parthians coming in from the outside. But this second seal refers to an internal strife that is going to be happening within, right? So that's kind of what we see happening here. This writer is going to be instigating people to kill, to murder, right? And so the, the Greek word that is used here means that, to kill and to commit murder. And I'm just giving you guys time to, to get to write down the notes here. And what it suggests, again, is that the violence and the savagery of kind of the civil rebellion that takes place. Think of it this way. It's civil rebellion. It's just, it's just you know, a, a release of violence in the society at, at that particular time, right? Again, it, it probably recalls back to Zechariah. If we go back to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 13, right? And it says, on that day, men will be stricken by the Lord with great panic. Each man will seize the hand of another and they will attack each other. So it's speaking of this kind of internal strife that is going on where panic falls on them from the Lord, right? And also recalls the words of Isaiah. We see this as well, where in Isaiah, it says that, Isaiah says that God will stir up the Egyptians and they will fight brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor. And I was also thinking of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 21, where he says this. He says, let me make sure I'm getting the exact words here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 21, 20, uh, 21 and 22. And he says, brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So again, Jesus is, 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 a, prof is a prophetic word here of what will happen in the end. Essentially, what is happening here is, again, very much similar to Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians, that this is an unleashing of lawlessness, violence, lawlessness, um, where there are no restrictions on and, and no laws barring, you know, all of these things that we consider to be crime, right? Kind of see that today right well it's going to be 10 times worse than what we see today right it's it's kind of like you know i i haven't seen this movie but I, you know it's a movie called the purge where they believe that you know that it's like all laws have been suspended right all laws have been suspended and and all the prisoners have been released from the prisons right so imagine you let, you let out all the rapists, all the murderers, all the, the, the child molesters. I mean, you just release them all from prison and then you suspend all laws. Imagine what will happen, right? It's just lawlessness. It's just violence and bloodshed everywhere, you know? And it will be, and it'll be a, one against the other, like, like Jesus says, right? Brother against brother, brother will betray brother to death, father, his child, children will have their parents put to death, right? And so it's the removal of all restraints, right? And so this writer is given a large sword, which signifies, again, the, is this picture of internal strife and violence that will follow the conquest of obviously the first writer. So the mission of the, the red horse is, is 
it, 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 it should be understood and it will be, and it is understood and was understood in John's day that this was acquainted with rebellion and civil disorder and unrest. Instability in the society, right? And again, we might not here in the West understand it, but back in, in fact, in, in, in their time, in the year 68 and 69, Rome went through four different emperors in one year. <laughs> one rose to power, assassinated the other one. The other one rose to power, assassinated that one. Another one rose to power. I mean, it was just violence and, you know. In fact, during the time of Herod the Great, the 30-year reign of Herod the Great, it is estimated that more than 100 thousand people insurgents died in revolutions and rebellions just in palestine alone anarchy bloodshed those two things are the harbingers those two things are the hallmarks of the coming of the end right jesus says you know watch out for those things By the way, th these were the four emperors, like I said, the year of the four emperors, 68, 69, one after the other. You look, go back and look at how long each one served, just but a few months, right? And then, and then another one comes, another one, <laughs> right? Four emperors. Exactly, right. Exactly. And in fact, I was just telling my students this, that any society that removes God removes any kind of sense of moral boundary and protection and, and guidance, right? You only have to look at the atheistic societies of history, right? Look at, you look, you look at, you know, Soviet communism, or you look at North Korean uh, dictatorship and all these countries where you've had atheistic governments, right? And look at how they, you know, they just kill and 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 maim and treat, you know, their 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 citizens in in horrific ways. All right, now to the third writer. Look, he says, I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Now the opening of the third seal introduces the black horse, whose rider holds measuring scales in his hands. Now, he is told by the voice from amongst the four living creatures to ration the wheat and the barley, but not to touch the oil and the wine. Now, who is the rider? Now, this black, you know, horse and the, the rider, black obviously signifies or symbolizes mourning, right? Sorrow, despair. And of course, the horseman himself represents famine. It represents what's going to happen as a result of poverty and hardship. Now, of course, in ancient times, black, and in, in many cultures today, black represents that negative, it has negative meaning, negative connotation. It's usually associated with darkness, death, right? All of these things. And so black was that, was that harbinger of that. And so therefore it was often used to symbolize that. It was used to symbolize death. It was used to symbolize the underworld. And so in this passage, we see this black horse representing death, famine, <laughs> right? It's indicated by the scales in his hands. He's holding these scales. And of course that was what was used to measure the barley or the wheat. And so the voice from the center of the throne room announces that farming, because of the, the farming, the prices for wheat and barley would go up. Which, of course, back in those days, wheat and barley were like the staple food. That's what people use to make the bread and the, the other food that they ate. So in his hands, uh, when he holds these scales, it's, it's, it's talking about and signifying the cost of a measure of wheat and barley the basic food commodities was going to go up, right? And of course, the it was going to be the equivalent of the denarius. The denarius was equivalent to a day's wages. So imagine you're going to spend your entire day's wage to buy just a little bit of barley, a little bit of wheat to get something to eat, right? Uh, by the way, again, the denarius was, 
um, a, the coin that was used during the time of Domitian. This is Domitian, the man who thought he was a god, right? Lord and God, the emperor. Uh, that was the emperor during the time that the book of Revelation was written. So therefore, you can see it was used to symbolize death here, right? And the underworld. And in this passage, the black horse represents that. It represents farming. The basic food commodities are completely um, uh, going up. And by the way, I don't know why I have this twice. Please forgive me. But it also suggests a time of scarcity beginning from here. So this is, you've already seen this part before, right? Beginning from, it suggests a time of scarcity. I somehow typed it twice. I was... My sometimes I'm, I'm <laughs> my brain kind of you know freezes sometimes I guess <laughs> so it suggests this time of scarcity of very high inflation we you know we're talking about inflation these days here you know here in America trust me this 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 is child's play inflation compared to what what we're talking about here in this in this biblical sense right the cost of food commodities would skyrocket, right? It will be 10 to 12 times the usual amount that it costs. So the warning that we see at the end to leave the barley, excuse me, to leave the oil and the wine, and that should be wine, not wind, again, typo, to, to, to leave the oil and the wine untouched can be interpreted in a number of ways one of the interpretations that I saw with regards to leaving the oil and the wine, one interpreter, one commentator said, perhaps it's a way of saying that the rich are untouched by this, that it's the poor who suffer, right? Because the barley and the wheat are what the poor would live on. The oil and wine are things that for the, for the wealthy. And what's interesting is barley and wheat are needed for daily survival. Oil and wine are like luxuries. <laughs> right but he's saying but don't touch the oil and the wine in the sense saying the rich are the ones who are going to um kind of make it through in that sense i don't necessarily think that's what this is saying i think this is a way of god saying even in the midst of all of this suffering and and famine and all of that he he still limits how far the destruction will go right that's what i think that is saying because we see it also when the fourth rider comes to, to the scene yeah. right so he, you know, they, it, again, and this is what is amazing that it shows that even in the midst of this judgment, there is still God's mercy, right? He tempers his judgment with mercy, right? That's what I see in this. All right, the last two verses here. I looked, he says, and therefore, be, and there before me was a pale horse. Now, when the lamb opens the fourth seal here, the fourth living creature calls out, and there comes out a horse, the color of death, right? A pale horse. Um, this is, I mean, this is, this is probably, like I said here, the grimmest image that we can see. And of course, he says, Hades follows closely behind him. Hades signifying death. It's a personification of death, the underworld, right? So this is, like I said, perhaps... The grimmest, the ghastliest image, the color of this horse is pale. It's a sickly, greenish, gray color of a corpse. And of course, it signifies this personification of death as his rider. Death and Hades, obviously, Hades is the grave. Now, we don't know if Hades is on his own horse or is Hades walking behind this horse. We don't know. But Hades follows death. Right. And one of the interesting things we see, of course, is that death and Hades are always linked together. We see it in Revelation later on uh, in, in, in uh, um, chapter 20. Of course, early in chapter one, we also see death and Hades. Right. Death and Hades will be defeated. As we will see in chapter 20. Right. So, again, it's not clear how Hades follows, if he's on foot or he's riding on another horse. But in any case, he's following death. And power was given to this rider to kill in these four ways, by the sword, famine, plague, or wild animals. And so these four specific <laughs> ways that he has been given authority to kill, they are based on the four dreadful judgments of Ezekiel chapter 14. Again, we go back 
to the Old Testament, to Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21. He says, for this is what the sovereign Lord says. How much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beasts and plague to kill its men and their animals. Yet there will be some survivors, right? So that's kind of, again, it's, it's, it's hearkening back to that, to that call from Ezekiel, right? And again, it's an intensification. It's, it's taking it up a notch. It's taking it up another level. It's an intensification of the first three seals that we see here. This grim picture of bloodshed and famine and death and all this that comes with it. Of course, plagues and wild beasts, beasts they're often the result of carnage and, and all of that, of famine and war. But again, God tempers his judgment with mercy. He limits, it says here that, uh, you know, it, it limits it to the fourth of the earth. Now it's not a geographical reference here, but to the amount of humanity that is affected, right? Only a fourth of the, the human population of the human race is affected by this. So he tempers again, his judgment says there was given to him uh, there was given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, uh, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. All right, so there you have it, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And, you know, as we, we, we close out this section tonight, I think as we reviewing these, you know, you think about all the various interpretations that have been assigned to these four horsemen. At the end of the day, I, you know, it's, it, one has to kind of just take it in <laughs> and, and, and realize that this is God's judgment coming on the world, right? Um, and the visions that, we, that John is seeing here, uh, in, in a sense, we, we almost have to experience it through John's eyes and not even get so much caught up in an, an analyzing it and trying to figure out who's this, who's that, even though that's important but experience what it really means that we can approach revelation with this imagination and, and with this sense of, of, of um, what's the word I'm thinking of, of urgency, that's the word, of urgency that, we, you know, there's, there, there are souls that need to be saved before all of this happens. Because there are people out there who do not know that, you know, this is imminent. Like I said, I was thinking about this yesterday that, you know, Jesus could come back at any moment. And who knows when, you know, all of these things would be initiated. So if anything, I think it, it must stir us to proclaim the gospel, right? To proclaim the gospel, to, to you know, like missionaries going to the ends of the earth. Jesus says this gospel will be preached. You know, you want to know when the end will come, <laughs> right? He says all of these things will happen. He says, but the end is not yet. Right. But then he says, this gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. So let's go. You may not be a missionary like Juan Carlos and Colette, but you're a missionary in your own way, in your own world, in your own sphere of influence. Right. So let's go. Let's tell the world. Let's tell them Jesus saves. Let's proclaim it loud and clear. Jesus saves. We are now in the in the age of grace. We're not in the age of judgment yet. These have not yet begun to happen, but they're, in, they're soon to come, right? And may, may God help us when those things begin, right? So let's close out in prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your redemption. We thank you for your mercy that you have shown to us, Lord. And so, Lord, may we have that sense of urgency, that sense of um, uh, a need to go out to 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 share your love, to share the, your forgiveness, your, your 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 redeeming grace with the world who who do not know you, who do not know what is about to happen. And so, God, give us opportunities, Lord, every day to share your love, to share your word with those we meet. Be with my friends now, even as we depart. May we not depart from your presence, uh, but may you always be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
<laughs> no, 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 no song tonight. <laughs> A lot to think about. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor.